Martin. Hello, everybody. My name is Lassie McHugh. I'm from Curve Lake First Nation, and I'm really excited to be here with my good friend Elwood to launch a new web video series this month with Ryerson University in partnership with Music Eddie's Foundation. We're going to be talking about global Indigenous solidarity and what that means to the guests that we're going to be having on our new series. Uh, we're really excited to have different sensibilities, different knowledges, um, different ways of knowing and being, and hopefully have a discussion and a conversation with you as well. So we hope that you're going to tune in this month um, to check out who we have in store. Yeah, and I'm Elwood Jimmy. I'm originally from Thunder Child Cree Nation in what we now know as Northern Saskatchewan. I'm really happy to be working on this project with my dear friend and colleague Leslie as we as we get to meet and spend time with uh, our global Indigenous family, uh, in particular members from the Global North and the Global South. Uh, we're looking forward to the complexities and the diversities of, of the Indigenous perspectives that I think that will be that will be unraveled over the next several weeks and will be shared with you. And we really look forward to you sharing this journey with us as we uh, as we look for ways to find common ground, but then also look at the differences within global Indigenous perspectives. It's sure to be an interesting time, so please join us and and uh, we look forward to uh, to sharing this work with you. Thanks. Much. Thank you. Anine. Hello, everybody. Hello, Ryerson University and social media. Uh, my name is Leslie McHugh. I'm from Curve Lake First Nation, and I'm excited to be here today to talk a little bit about global Indigenous solidarity. And I'm Elwood Jimmy. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm originally from Thunder Child First Nation in um, uh, North Midwest uh, Canada from the north, but currently based in Toronto, the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we're here today um, talking on behalf of Ryerson as well as the Music Eddies Foundation uh, around, as Leslie mentioned, Indigenous global solidarity. And uh, we have a guest today that, uh, that I had the privilege of meeting here in Toronto uh, through the Imaginative uh, Media Arts Festival that happens every year. Um, I was really lucky to meet Houston and his mother at a few of the events in previous years. And this, this work focuses on Indigenous perspectives around Indigenous global solidarity, uh, particularly in the Americas. So, so this series will um, engage people from North America and our friends in the global South, including Peru and Ecuador and Brazil, as well as uh, more local folks uh, within the within the Southern Ontario region. And, um, but yeah, we're really happy to have uh, Houston Cypress join us today. And um, uh, Houston, um, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It means a lot to have you here. And um, I would love for you to, to kindly introduce yourself and, and tell our audience a little bit about, about what your interests are and what kind of work you do and your kind of connection to to solidarity, uh, which is kind of the, the thematic focus for this series. So thank you, Houston. Inga, tiga ta, iti yamgi ho pale ala hita pik chotamisa. Just wanted to say thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, my name is Houston Cypress, and I'm from the Otter Clan of the Mikasuki tribe of Indians of Florida. And um, I also have a Mikasuki name, and my Mikasuki name is currently Yahalipke. So thanks for uh, letting me um, get to know y'all and collaborate with y'all and share just a little bit about some of the things that I appreciate and enjoy. Um, let's see, I grew up in the River of Grass region, which is a beautiful watershed that is located in the Florida Peninsula. Um, today, it's just west of Miami, Florida. And the community that I'm from, um, we have a beautiful relationship with these lands and these waters. And it's been expressed through this spiritual philosophy that we call the circle of life. And these are things that help us to stay connected and in balance with uh, um, all the different aspects of life and the universe. Um, so what I enjoy doing, I enjoy the arts, I enjoy cinema, I enjoy storytelling. And I think all of these things are um, inspired just by growing up out in the Everglades, um, making trails in the bushes, climbing trees, and today um, finding ways to share that sense of joy 
um, with all kinds of communities here in South Florida and around the world. Uh, lately, I've been doing that through this nonprofit that me and my buddy started called Love the Everglades Movement. But we always try our best to, um, to learn from what our uh, indigenous neighbors and our indigenous hosts are prioritizing. And I say it like that because even though I'm from the community, like that's my home, um, what I'm trying to do, what me and my buddies are trying to do with this nonprofit is to show um, like one example, one model of what creative solidarity with the natural world could look like. And a big part of that is indigenous solidarity too. So um, the kinds of things that we're learning and uh, experimenting with here in South Florida um, has um, a lot to do with uh, balancing different kind of knowledge systems, different kinds of joys, uh, different kinds of medicines, and finding ways to um, bring those together in ways that respect each other's sovereignties. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I've been involved in. But in my home community, um, we have a lot of different things that we do according to our lunar calendar. And it's a cyclical kind of life. So depending on what moon we're in, it depends like what we're doing at that time of the year. And it's a lot of fun just being able to help out in whatever way we can. I'm from the Otter Clan, and if you get to know us a little bit better, then you will realize that we are the Hotter Clan. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we all, like, uh, all of our clans, like, really try to help each other out in different ways. It's a little bit of service that we're learning as we're growing up. And a lot of this idea of service really comes to the forefront when we're in ceremony. But uh, I think of it as, like, a big family, and we try our best to stick together. And I think that um, we all do things in our own unique ways. And that's this idea of respect that, um, that infuses the work that I do with the nonprofits and with uh, collaborations with other communities. But um, I guess overall, it's just trying to um, um, share this sense of joy with people. I like that you, you, know, you touched upon, you know, around solidarity around, I think, kind of with human relations, but you've also, really touched upon, I think something really important too is uh, solidarity and, and really intimate relationships with our non-human, you know, our non-human uh, family and, and also also the world that, that you know, that nourishes us and, uh, and so much labor, that invisible labor that the earth provides for us to, to be here and, and to do this kind of work. Um, I was thinking about, you know, you 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 have a very kind of relational uh, practice that that engages many many different communities and many many uh, different people from different parts of the world that really um, I feel it sounds like it really influences influences what you do on a more local level. Um, do you find um, I guess like I guess maybe a two part question is how does that shape the day to day for you and uh, what um, are there any challenges or limitations within within that kind of con, con, can confine that work? Um, if you could, you know, maybe have a response around around that. So, and I talk about I'm coming at this from the angle of like environmental activism and environmental advocacy because that's what has been a lot of my focus these days. And so, um, as I think about that, some of the um, Priority is that my home community, Miccosukee tribe, um, our neighbors and friends and family, the Seminole tribe of Florida, and then our spiritual leaders, the independent communities. Like some of the priorities that we have um, really have so much to do with trying to help the natural world that we are a part of to thrive because our practices and our way of life, depend, they, like we thrive together is what I'm trying to say. And so as we do that, though, we're facing a, a lot of environmental degradation in the area that has been caused by industry and development and colonization and apathy and just the ways that the stories of the land itself has been changed by other people. And so um, part of the frustration comes when, when we realize that it's so human-centered, so people-centered, and the solutions that we're, that people are advocating for are just prioritizing what is gonna benefit people. But so much of what um, my elders in collaboration with scientists and other people are trying to do are create the conditions for everybody and everything to thrive. So like when I think about that, like those are the things that influence me on a day-to-day -day level. 
Like, what can we do to support all the species, all the lives, all the things that are seen and unseen out here? <clears throat> so I think that's how it influences my daily practice and how I go about my work. And what was the second part of the question? I guess, you know, I mean, I think you've answered it. I think yeah. the, the, you know, the second part was more about the kind of limitations and challenges of the work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I were to think about like limitations and challenges too, I think overall is just, again, it comes back to balance, right? Because not only are we trying to, our best to help everything stay in balance and not just focus on what people need or what businesses need, but um, what do we need as well, like to sustain that work, to sustain our joy, to sustain our gardens. And so um, sometimes we have to um, really take care of ourselves and make sure that we're doing well and take care of each other and our families. And so I think that um, like balance is something that um, is a priority in that because um, the, the, the things that challenge us, um, the apathy, the extraction, the um, the language barriers can throw us off balance. And there's also this, um, the way that we understand like how much time we're working with because things are urgent, but we also have to really like take time and make sure that we're doing things right. And that's some of the things that I'm always reminded of by um, the people that I work with in my community. Um, they always remind us to slow down and Take things, take our time with doing things, even though there is a sense of urgency, right? Um, but still, take your time, do it right. Mm -hmm. If it requires a song, sing the song. If it requires protocol, respect the protocol. But um, so it's like a balance between urgency and um, respect for taking your time to do things right too. Mm -hmm. So speaking about that, that urgency um, and also the time to. Um, allow space for things to happen when they need to happen. Um, how do we get youth involved? Or why is it important for youth to also get involved in global Indigenous solidarity? And do you have any advice for youth trying to get involved? You know, I, like in terms of youth engagement, we've always been kind of doing this work of Indigenous solidarity and global Indigenous solidarity. And like when I think back of... Um, my own community's history and how we came to be here in South Florida, um, I'm just reminded of what has worked for us. And this idea of solidarity and uh, showing up for each other, but in ways that respect each other's sovereignty mm -hmm. um, has been something that has happened many, many times over the centuries. Like it's worked, it's working and it continues to work. Like some specific examples that I can think of is for example, that during the, um, what other people call the Seminole Wars or the Indian War era in here in the southeastern part of the United States, um, we benefited and were able to endure that onslaught because of the help of visitors, other indigenous communities from the north that came down and shared their medicine with us. And that medicine was what helped us to like, um, not necessarily win certain battles, but to survive them. Um, so sharing this medicine, I think, is a way of like showing up for each other, but in ways that respect each other's sovereignty. And so when we traded these medicines, things had to be traded and like a reciprocal reciprocity was like expressed there. And so like that's one example that I can think of. Um, in more contemporary times, like my community, the Miccosukee tribe, was able to form a coalition with the Seminoles, the Choctaws, and the Cherokees here in the south Southeast to create this organization called the United South and Eastern Tribes. And so I think this is just saying that, like this is the kind of work that we've always been engaged in. Our ancestors have done this. Um, we're doing this today. And I think in doing this, like we're reminding the young people that these are just ways that we have to continue to show up for each other and help each other out. Um, but again, in ways that respect each other's sovereignties because there's always a line that we have to respect. Sometimes we are invited to come close to that line. Maybe there's a special occasion that we can cross and, and pray together in an interfaith or multi-faith manner. But then there's definitely going to be times that we can't do that and we have to respect that too. And that's just a beautiful thing that um, to be able to respect where we are and where we're standing on the land together. So um, <clears throat> in terms of 
like um if i were to give like <clears throat> any kind of advice to young people um i think what has worked for me what has worked for my community and like what i'm reminded of is just to listen deeply to the land and find ways to do that just and that can be kind of fun too like you can have a very serious like protocol about like doing that but you can also have a sense of joy um experiment with it like we have a lot of tools and techniques today that we can try out that can augment um, the kinds of things that we've been taught um, by our communities. So yeah, listening deeply, have a sense of joy about it, experiment, and maybe even create new protocols and new ways of listening deeply to the land. But I think for me, um, the, that's like the, the foundation and that primary relationship that it inspires. Awesome. Well, thank, you, thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the reasons that, that we're kind of gathered here today is because the, the kind of inspiration for, for this interview series was uh, Ryerson's uh, Powell Education Week. Mm -hmm. And um, you touched upon like one of the next questions I really wanted to ask was around, um, you know, kind of events, gathering, ceremony that your, your, your specific community has around exchanging, you know, dialogue between indigenous people. But uh, I guess the question for me out of that would be, because you talked about new protocols and I, which I'm really excited about because I always feel historically um, kind of something that maybe happened in, in many different indigenous communities is, you know, we're kind of going through, through a phase of, you know, recognizing and honoring maybe diverse identities that were always existed, but through the colonial process were kind of negated or marginalized and whatnot. So, so we live in a really exciting time now where we can actually kind of reclaim and really honor some of those really diverse identities and sexualities and genders and these kind of things. So I wanted to ask if, if um, uh, there are things that you're involved with that really kind of open, open and maintain and, and create uh, really generative and safe space for for younger people that you know don't necessarily kind of identify within binaries or anything like that so um yeah if, you, if there are an example you could provide of that i would, would love to hear about it well thank you so i'm um, i'm just thinking about like how um some of the experiences and challenges that i had to grow through in in my life and um, what I mean is that as I was becoming a teenager, I identified first um, in with this coming out process of being a gay man um, and then kind of exploring the worlds that um, some people think that that's about. So, uh, and what I thought that was about. And so I had these ideas and stereotypes of what that was and I went and explored that. But I kind of felt um, further and further from what my roots were, what my roots are. And so... That's when I learned a little bit more about um, the Two-Spirit Movement and the different societies across the land that um, honor these ideas and these practices. And, and it inspired me as, um, as um, a way of staying connected to my roots, but also honoring who I am and who I would like to be. And I say it like that because even though I am a gay man, um, I also identify um, like with... Uh, in between is how I think about it, whereas other people might think of it as a non-binary situation. I like to think of myself as being in between. And so that two-spirit idea really helped me to think about the fact and honor the fact that I can stay connected to my roots um, and be LGBTQ and be in between as well. And later on, I learned that like, even though my Mekasuki community has very strict binary roles for men and for women, like I learned that our, our friends and our family in the Creek communities have other ways of being. And that's this idea of in between and they use the word inaskaba. And so that's kind of like helped me to find a little bit of balance in the kinds of things that I'm living um, and the kind of ways that I'm living. But um, today, I'm really happy that the young people themselves are finding, um, are creating support networks for themselves because I'm seeing, um, even though our community is small, we have a few trans people, we have a, uh, a few young people that are identifying as queer and quite a, like a, a handful of people that are identifying also with the two-spirit identities and that movement. So that's something that um, I'm trying to be supportive of down here and, and seeing how... Um, what their needs are. Because even though like what worked for me may not work for other people, 
So it's just a way of like finding out like what's the best way to respect each other and hold each other up and and um, do what we can to bring a smile to each other's faces. And I like to say it like that because there's so many things that want to distract us and so many things that want to um, 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 manipulate us or just kind of um, take that spirit from us. And so even though um, it might sound a little bit frivolous by saying put a smile on each other's faces, I think that's a beautiful thing too. Because like some of our greatest ceremonies, the, wor the words that we use to describe it are happiness. Like that's one of the ways that we describe our most important New Year ceremony, the happiness, the happiness that it cultivates, the joy that it cultivates. And so I think that it can sound a little bit frivolous at times, but it's also like very um, um, primary and sincere and potent as well. So um, thinking about gender and gender diversity in my community these days, I think those are some of the things that young people are asking for. Um, those are the kind of things that has worked for me. And um, those are just some of the ideas that we're exploring um, and supporting each other with here down in uh, Miccosukee and Seminole lands. Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Um, so you talked a little bit about things that distract us from the work, um, especially with COVID-19 going on and ongoing crises. Um, how does that shape the nature um, and importance of Indigenous global solidarity? How can we continue to do that work during these tough times? Because hmm. um, you know, when I think about the COVID situation and this global pandemic that we're in, mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I think about that, that situation, um, I'm really inspired and hopeful and... Um, enlivened by the fact that we still have access to our traditional plant medicines and our songs and our healing practices. And I hope that we can always have the conditions for these things to thrive. But I'm also happy that we can find a balance with um, the type of medicines that are created by science and things like that so that we can have a little bit of both. Like definitely hold on to um, our medicine, but also find ways that we can take the things that work from science um, for our communities. Um, but saying that in terms of that pandemic and the kinds of healing practices that sustain us in that kind of situation, um, and then putting that in the light of like global indigenous solidarity, um, it's been hard because of this need for isolation when um, when we're used to getting together and sharing um, our best advice with each other. And again, I look back to that idea of the USEP organization because um, that has been, um, I guess some people might call it like a lobbying organization. And, but I think it, it's also just a, a bigger sort of community that we've cultivated for each other. And so um, when we get together in those kind of situations, um, I've been really happy to like learn from what other communities are doing and to share what we're doing over here at home with each other and to keep that dialogue going. But it's been harder and harder to do those kind of things just because of like trying to be um, social distance and safe in this pandemic situation. Um, so those are some challenges I'm seeing, mm -hmm. but um, there's also some hope there too in the ways that we can uh, try our best to balance our healing practices with uh, the benefits that come from science. But um, even though I, I am inspired and hopeful for what science brings, like it's not like the, the end all for me like it's just one of the tools that's available for us and if anything like I'm like I, I'm really more prioritizing the traditional healing practices than anything. Well thank you so much for that Houston. Um, I, I feel you know I, will, I, I guess it's time to thank you. Thank you for this time. Um, I guess our, our time here is wrapping up very quickly. Um, I guess We'd like to to thank you again, but then offer um, offer this time for you. If there's anything that we haven't really touched upon that you really wanted to to kind of relay within within this context and within this time we've had together, um, we'd love to uh, just offer this time to you right now. Cool, thank you. You know, again, I just want to underscore the fact of um, this idea of global indigenous solidarity is something that um, has happened before 
happens today and will happen in the future. And I was talking um, earlier about some of the historical examples of other communities coming to help us out, uh, the ways that we've been helping today, uh, showing up for other communities, other indigenous communities, and um, really trying our best to um, understand the parlance of other communities, whether that is through um, legal, political mechanisms, whether it's through ceremonies and the arts, and um, just understanding the fact that um, there's always gonna be a line and that we gotta respect that line, but maybe every now and then we can create new choreographies where we dance respectfully across that with one another uh, in, a, in a beautiful rhythm. And so, um, uh, again, thank you very much for helping me to think through these ideas again with y'all. It's been really nice. And I look forward to collaborating with you and for anybody else that's watching um, around the world, I do want to invite you to come and visit me and my community in the River of Grass. Uh, we have a lot of beautiful things that are still surviving and thriving out here. And I'd love to be able to share the joys of our gardens with you. So the invitation is open. Hopefully Elwood and I will be able to travel those uh those ways soon. Um, once COVID is is done, we would love to visit sometime or um, I hear you come up this way a lot. So hopefully one day we'll be able to meet you in person. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Houston. And uh, I'm just so looking forward to watching this series unfold. And just uh, even though we're interviewing people kind of individually in their own context, I, I really think there's going to be the people watch the whole series, there's going to be a really interesting dialogue that happens and the collaboration, as you mentioned, even though not everybody's met yet, but I just kind of feel we're laying the ground for us to all eventually collectively uh, cross paths in the future when it's uh, when it's safe to travel again. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Houston. Really appreciate your time with us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.